Okay, so um, I'm going to look for our first question as I get some of my notes together. Um, okay, so the question is, is uh, based on Revelation uh, chapter 12, do you, still, do you think uh, Satan is still bound? Um, I do think he's bound, but we got to understand that that binding isn't a destruction. It's a limiting of his power specifically to deceive nations. So he still, he still is around, and he's like a roaring lion looking who he can devour, but he's basically focused on individuals because he can no longer, uh, he, he no longer has the power and authority to sway entire nations. So he's been extremely limited. So in the book of Revelation, you'll notice that he's bound, but it's in the context of deceiving nations, not that he's not able to tempt and seduce individuals. So there's still a lot of activity that's going on around us in terms of who Satan is, his angels, and what he's trying to accomplish. He's just been extremely limited. Now, I do want to just give you the caveat that it looks like there's been a significant change over the last couple of decades, and we are, we're seeing a decline uh, for decades now uh, in terms of Christian nations and the church itself. It, it, seems like, it seems like Christianity is just really kind of diminished for, for some reason. So I do think that possibly uh, we are at the end of this, this, this time called a thousand years, um, symbolic of a very long period of time, and that Satan might have been released already because it appears that the nations as nations are coming under darkness once again on a level that we haven't seen since uh, 2,000 years ago. So that's my, my idea about that. Okay. Um, what would be the purpose for, of giving Satan his keys back for a short time? Uh, thank you, Jessica. Uh, yeah, it's a great, it's a fascinating question, a good question. And I don't think there's probably a good answer. I'm not sure why uh, that takes place. But for whatever reason, God, God has, has given permission, orchestrated that actually, is directing that, so that Satan has his authority and power for a short time. Now, you've got to use the phrase a thousand years. That's a very long period of time, contrasted with a very short period of time. So whatever that period of time is, it's going to be very short in comparison to the period of time that he was bound. But in that very short period of time, he's going to hold sway. Once again, he's going to deceive the nations, specifically the nations around the four corners. And, and that could be in reference to the land of Israel itself. But regardless, it, it speaks of widespread deception among the, in the nations, once again, to gather them against God's people and those who are associated with God's people. And, and, and the purpose of that is what that purpose has always been. Satan wants to destroy the people of God, wants to destroy uh, um, not only Israel, but everyone who identifies with the God of Israel, the Messiah of Israel. And so there, there is a final push to accomplish that. The good news is, and we're going to get down there in the next week or two, the good news is God's going to rain fire down from heaven, and it's going to absolutely obliterate these nations that have gathered against Israel and against those who support and advocate and associate with Israel. God's going to destroy all those nations that come against her. And again, it's all figurative language. It's highly symbolic. So I, I don't think God's going to do some supernatural thing. I think he's describing something in a way that just gets everyone's attention and paints the picture of an ultimate defeat of the enemy. Now, now it could be that he uses natural phenomenon to fulfill, fulfill the, the uh, spiritual phenomenon that's being described here. And, and so what that could be, and a number of commentators have weighed in on it, is the idea that in the end, what rains down on these nations that gather against Israel is nuclear holocaust, nuclear fire that, that Israel releases and probably us in conjunction with her releases uh, uh, just a, a tremendous amount of nuclear bombs on these nations that have sought to 
genocide the people of God and, and, and that God uses that to finally judge not only, not only the serpent and, and, and his angels, but the offspring of the serpent. Remember back in Genesis 3, it talks about the offspring of the serpent. It's in reference to those who reject the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or reject the people of God, reject the Messiah, and, and allow their hearts to be filled with hatred and greed and envy. Those are referenced as the children of darkness and the nations that are filled uh, with this darkness that come against the people of God to genocide them. They finally are, are genocided themselves, so to speak, if I can make up a word. So uh, that's the ultimate crisis that's coming. And of course, the test of faith always are these crises. You know, will we stay faithful in, even in the midst of persecution, even in the midst of war? Will we stay faithful? And that's the story of Hanukkah, isn't it? That's the story of dedicating our lives to him and being courageous like the Maccabees, saying, no, we will keep the commandments of God and our faith in the light of the world, Yeshua, the light of the world. We're going to stay faithful to the Messiah, and we're going to keep the commandments of God. Come hell or high water. That's the story of Hanukkah. And that's in our spiritual DNA. So, yeah, there's going to be a final crisis. We're going to make it. God's going to empower us. And we'll stay, stay faithful even in the light of losing our lives. Okay, good. Let me go on. Um, what about Revelation 26? Um, that's from Elena. Um, so, so I don't have that in front of me. Let me see if I can go there really quick. Uh, but we, we will pick up the rest of these passages. We just haven't got there yet. But let me just uh, grab this if I can, just to get an idea. Blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Uh, we're going to unpack that. There's a lot there. But the idea is, is this, that we're called to rule and reign with Jesus in contrast to the rule and reign of the enemy. And the period of time that we rule and reign in this passage is for that thousand years. So whatever that thousand years is, if you want to take that literally and that's coming in the future, uh, the people of God are going to rule and reign at that time with Christ. And, uh, you know, our position is, um, and, and you can have different positions on this, but if it's in reference to this period of time between the resurrection of Jesus and the return of Jesus, how is it that we are ruling and reigning with Christ now? And I'm going to give you some answers on how that uh, happens and what that looks like, uh, both in our lives and, uh, and especially for those in the Lord that die and their souls go to heaven or paradise, they continue to rule and reign in the heavenlies as we rule and reign here through Christ, uh, advancing the kingdom of light here on earth as it is in heaven. So that work continues on. So it doesn't matter how you view the thousand years, it's within that thousand years that the saints rule and reign. There's other passages that go on to say, after this thousand years is over, we'll continue to rule and reign with Christ forever. So uh, that's exciting. Whatever that might mean, that's exciting. Whatever your position might be on the millennium, whether it's literal or figurative, it's all exciting. So that's kind of a preview of where we're going to go with that. Okay, let me go back to another question. Okay. Okay, I think, I think that might be it. So the thousand years is going to be probably a lot of questions surrounding that. Again, the thousand years is referred to as a millennium. The question is, is when does the, the millennium begin? And so uh, a lot of ideas about that. Is it literal? Is it, is it, is it uh, a figure of speech? Does Jesus come at the beginning and kick it off, or does he come at the end of it? A lot of different ways to view that. My personal view is that the millennium is a figure of speech. It describes the binding of Satan and the resurrection of Jesus. That's the start of the millennium. It runs for a very, very long time. 
And then at the end of that millennium, Satan's released for a short time, and then he deceives the nations, and then Jesus returns and obliterates them. That have surrounded his people to destroy them. And that kicks off the age to come and the final resurrection and the great white throne judgment and the destruction of Satan in the lake of fire. Uh, that's my particular view. And of course, it could be wrong. I don't think it is, but it certainly could be. And so we're not dogmatic on these things. This is eschatology. This is the study of end time events. And so we're certainly open for different positions. So um, yeah, we'll all have to kind of work through that as we go through this passage. All right, I think uh, Braden had a question. Let me go up here. Okay, Braden, with the period of time that Satan is bound, possibly being over or close to it, what is your perspective on where the rapture fits into Revelation prophecies? Okay, that's a great question. Uh, again, a very controversial matter. The rapture is super, it's a hot potato, right? A lot of different views on that. Uh, but let me just give you the short and skinny, okay? So the rapture is going to take place at the second return of Messiah. He's going to come back to our earth. He's returning to the earth. Now, if you take the imagery and the language that even describes that, it has an antecedent theology. And what you're going to discover is this, that in the ancient Near East, when a great king would come visit his vassal nations, those small nations that, that were apart and in covenant, that he would provide for and they would pay their taxes to, when he would come to visit one of his vassal nations, it'd be like a city, not really a nation like we think of, um, emissaries would go out ahead of time, uh, the city would know when the king's coming, and they would prepare to receive their king. And they would have a delegation of people from the city, very important people, a delegation that would come out of the city to meet him before he got to the city. And once they met him, they turned with him and they ushered him into their city. This is the language of the rapture, if you will. Jesus is coming. When he comes to our, our world, we're going to be caught up to meet him in the air. Where's he going? He's, he's coming here. This is, he's on his way here. We are coming up to meet him in order to come with him to this world where he will judge the living and the dead and appoint us on his thrones to assist in judging not only the living and the dead, but the angels themselves. So when he comes, we're going to be caught up to meet him in the air, only to return with him to establish the consummation of his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. So, whether it's, yeah, so that's, that's the big general answer, hopefully, that is not complete in any sense for you, but at least a good start. Okay. I think we are done. Are we done? I think we're done. Okay, so let me just close this up with prayer, uh, and then we'll pick this up next week. And thanks for staying and hanging with me and chatting and just encourage you to dive into uh, the book of Revelation chapter 20 as we work down through these passages. And, and uh, we'll do that together. We're going to have a great time. And uh, happy Hanukkah as it comes. It's coming quick. So, Father, we love you. We bless you. We thank you for this time. Your word is everything to us, Lord God. We just exalt your word as you have already in the heavenlies, as high as your very name. We thank you. We're enthralled with it. Come, shine the light of revelation, knowledge, and understanding in our hearts and minds, in regards to your word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet. So give us revelation and understanding that we might walk more fully as your people in the world around us, that we would be that light that draws all men and women to you. We love you. We bless you. In Yeshua's name, Shabbat Shalom.